together. So I'm grateful if you are joining us today and watching this, whether it's watching it in the morning or later uh, in the afternoon and evening, we're just glad that you're joining us today. Uh, I want to tell you a story about the first time I ever drove to go lead worship in my life. I was in college and one of my best friends had asked me to come lead worship for his youth group. I was so excited that someone would ask me to actually come and lead. At that point in time, we weren't using computers and projectors yet. All right, so I had printed out all of the lyrics for the songs that I was going to sing on paper, all right, which is this white thing that you write on for any of you that may not know. And so I took all these papers up uh, to this youth group that I was going to lead worship for. I handed it out, and one of the songs that I was leading was at that point a newer song called Heart of Worship by a guy named Matt Redman. And so we were, I gave the papers out, I had my friend look over everything before, and we start singing, and man, I'm just, I'm enthralled that I'm getting to lead worship for a group of people. So we hit this one song, Heart of Worship, and we get to the second verse, and I notice that everybody stops singing, and they kind of just start snickering and laughing, and, and I can't figure out why, but I'm, I'm not stopping, like I'm rolling down the tracks, man, I'm a train that cannot be stopped, so I worship, I go all the way through, and at the end of the service, I was like, hey, hey man, why, why were people laughing? Why didn't they sing during that second verse? And so my friend just hands me one of the lyric sheets that I had handed out that night. And the second verse of Heart of Worship has a line that says, though I'm weak and poor. Well, in my typing flurry, I had made a mistype. And so the sheets that I had handed out to a group of middle school and high school students said, though I'm weak and poop. <laughs> and of course they didn't sing, right? Because who's going to sing when those are the words on the paper? But can I tell you what still burns me about that today? It's one of the stories I really enjoy telling younger worship leaders. But what still gets me is that no one said anything. They all got the papers before time. I literally showed it to my best friend who was a youth minister before I started. And no one said anything before and no one said anything after. Like, right, because we don't talk about poop, right? Unless you're a parent, and then if you're a parent and you're watching this, then your whole life is talking about poop, okay? But it made me start thinking this week about the other things that we don't talk about. So I asked, I asked the Facebook social media world, what are the things that they do and never talk about? And what are the things that they know are important but never talk about? And I really expected to get a lot of, of silly answers. Answers like my friend Nick in Florida, who said that he eats the cream out of the Oreo cookies and then puts them back in the package. Like, who does that, right? Like, that's ridiculous. That's what I thought I was going to get. What I wasn't prepared for was the serious answers I got. Answers like chronic pain and marital problems. Answers like caring for adult children who were disabled. Answers like anxiety and depression and chronic illness. And it, it really kind of shook me for a moment this week to think about the big things, the serious things, the heavy things that we don't talk about. And to think about what impact that silence is having on us. You know, last week we were in the book of Colossians chapter three and we talked about the idea that when we meet Jesus, we are marked by Jesus. In other words, the idea that there is no way for us to experience the new life that Jesus offers us without being affected by it, without being changed by it. And so Paul takes this and he both positively and negatively defines what it looks like to live a marked life. And so first he paints a negative picture. And he says that the marks of a life that haven't met Jesus is sexual immorality, it's impurity, it's passion, it's evil desires, it's covetousness and idolatry, it's anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk and lying and prejudice. Paul says, look, if you want to know what it looks like to not follow Jesus, this is it. But then he says, if you want to know what it looks like when a life has met Jesus and has been marked by it, he gives a much shorter list. He says it looks like compassion. It looks like kindness, our meekness, our patience, our forgiveness. And above all else, Paul says, it looks like love. That love is the thing that we can tell that we've met Jesus, and love is the thing that by which others can tell that we have met Jesus. In fact, I love it because he we shared this verse from John chapter 13 that Jesus says himself when he says that by this, talking about love, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the test, 
This is how the world, we said, will know that we are Christians, not by something that we post on Facebook, not by us sharing a chain email or us posting a sermon. It's by love. It's how we walk with love. And so we ended last week with this question. What does the world see when they look at us? Do they see that first list? Do they see sexual immorality and anger and bitterness and jealousy and covetousness? Do they see all of those things that Paul says that doesn't mark your new life? Or do they see compassion and forgiveness and kindness and mercy and love? And look, that question is so important because of what we're going to talk about today. That question of what the world sees in us is so important because of one of those serious, heavy things that we don't talk about in the church. It's important because of hell. Now, I did this on purpose. Because doesn't it just kind of make you uncomfortable to see that word that big on the screen? It did me. Even as I typed it, even as I scaled it up, I was just uncomfortable. If I'm honest with you, this whole message and idea makes me uncomfortable. I was supposed to preach about this back in March and felt like the Lord wanted me to go somewhere else. And I found reason after reason after reason to not come back to this topic. But church family, I want you to know that we're not alone. In fact, I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, that there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. Someone once asked the great R.C. Sproul what doctrine of faith he struggled with the most, and he said it was this one. He said it was hell. And so right now, before we even jump into this, I want to make a couple disclaimers. First, this is not going to be a fire and brimstone sermon. That's not what you came for today. That's not what we ever do here. But this is not going to be a sermon that yells at you and tells you all the things that you're doing that would send you to hell. However, on the flip side, this is not going to be a sermon that is going to water down the reality of what hell is. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about hell because interestingly enough, Jesus didn't hesitate to speak on this topic. In fact, Jesus taught about hell more than any other biblical figure. He actually taught about hell and talked about it three times more than he talked about heaven. Did you know that? I didn't until I started talking and studying this week. But he talked about hell three times more than heaven. And so therefore, for us to truly understand why Paul exhorted the church in Colossae that everything they did, they needed to do in Jesus' name, why he commanded them to put on the qualities of the new life and to cast off the qualities of the old, I think we need to understand this topic that most of us, if we're honest, avoid at all costs. So I want to read with you out of the book of Luke, chapter 16. We're going to read actually verses 19 through 26 together. This is what scripture says. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. Now this is Jesus giving a parable. Verse 20 says, And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross there from us. Now look, first I want you to see the contrast of these two men. Do you notice that first one is rich and the other is poor? Secondly, though, one is covered in purple, Scripture says, while the other one, Jesus says, is covered in sores. One, Jesus says, lived in luxury while the other lived in poverty. One was nameless while the other, we have a name, his name was Lazarus. And so the question is, why does Jesus describe these men in this detail? 
Well, I think the answer is simple. I think the answer is that Jesus wanted to contrast the life that they were living and where they found their hope and pleasure. We know that because what he says in verse 19, he says that there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Now look, that word for feasted was the same word that the Greeks would have used when a conquering general came back from war. All right, it meant to feast and to be merry out of a sense of victory or triumph. In other words, Jesus is saying that this guy feasted because he felt a sense of victory over his life. He felt as if he deserved all that he had worked for. And that's where his pleasure and hope lay in this life. That's why in verse 25, Jesus says, look, you received all your good things in your life. Jesus isn't saying that it was bad for him to receive good things in life. He's saying you got everything you wanted in your life, whereas Lazarus didn't. Why? Because the rich man was looking at life here, while Lazarus didn't have anything to look for here. And so his only hope, his only pleasure could lay in heaven. And so while this rich man was feasting and feeling good about his life, I want you to also notice that he couldn't be bothered with someone who was in need at his door. Do you know scripture doesn't tell us that he had mercy on Lazarus at all. It doesn't tell us that he helped Lazarus at all. It does tell us that in verse 25 and 24 that he calls out and knew Lazarus's name. He says, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus down to dip his finger in the pool. So what that tells us is that this guy knew who this poor man was, who had been laid at his gate, and yet he had never lifted a finger to help. So here's what I want you to hear today. If you don't hear anything else, about hell, I want you to hear this, is that the easiest way for us to miss the kingdom of God is to live for ourselves. That's the easiest way. It doesn't come because we do this certain list of sins. It doesn't come because we don't go to the right church. It doesn't come because we don't say the right words. The easiest way for us to miss the kingdom of God is to live for ourselves. And what Jesus himself says in this parable is that missing the kingdom isn't just a matter of living an ethical, moral, or good life here. It's a matter of eternity. It's a matter of the difference between living with God and living without God. And so Jesus does that by teaching us some things about hell that I think every single one of us needs to know. The first is this. Look at verse 19. Uh, look at verses 22 and 23. Jesus says this. He says, The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. Now look, that word for Hades is not the normal word that's used for hell in the Bible. In fact, the two most common words for hell used in biblical literature are the word Gehenna and the word Sheol. One referred to a trash dump outside of Jerusalem that was considered forsaken, a place where literally the trash burned and smoldered 24 hours a day. The other word was a word that they used to describe a dark, deep pit. This word was not that. This word is the literal technical word in the Greek for hell. It's the same word that Homer used exclusively to talk about the underworld. So there is no symbolism in this word in Hades. The symbolism is that it means exactly what it means. Jesus doesn't use it, right, to invoke mythology or symbolism. He doesn't use it because he wants to point his audience to uh, purgatory or to the either of the universe or to just ending up in limbo. He uses it because for his audience, this word would have referred to the dismal state of death and decay that they associated with the underworld, with hell. Now, some scholars will debate this today, but what I want to tell you is I think the first thing Jesus is trying to say to his audience, the reason he uses this word and not either of the other two, is because he wanted us to know that hell is a real place. Hell is real. It's not myth. It's not made up. It's not symbol. It's a real place. And this guy missed the kingdom of God and didn't end up somewhere else. He missed the kingdom of God and he ended up in a very real spot. He ended up in hell. And I want you to look at how Jesus describes it. The first place he describes it is as a place of pain. Look at verse 23. Scripture says, And in Hades, being in torment. 
Now look, that word for torment was a word that they would have used to describe a piece of black silica. All right, It was a, a rock that they formed and they used literally for torture in the Greek and in the ancient world. And this word really speaks to pain. In fact, we know that because the first place it's used in the New Testament is in Matthew 4, 4, where it says, And they brought to him, talking about Jesus, all who were ill, those afflicted or suffering with various diseases and pain. Same word. So when this word is used, the connotation it's supposed to carry is the connotation of pain, which is why verse 24 tells us that when this man cries out, it says he is in anguish in this flame. He's suffering pain. Now, I know that that's not happy, but it's real. And what Jesus wants us to see in this parable is that not only is hell a real place, but it's a place of pain. Secondly, he wants us to see that it's a place of isolation. Look at verses 23 and 24. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Do you notice that the poor man, Lazarus, is carried to heaven, verse 22 tells us, by angels. And not only is he carried to heaven by angels, but he's carried to Abraham's side, to the figurehead of their faith, while no one is mentioned in verse 23. No one is mentioned with the rich man. He isn't carried by anyone. He isn't accompanied by anyone. In fact, the picture that we are given is that this man is alone, that he is isolated. I think Dante maybe grabs this and really gives us the best picture of it. In his Inferno, he describes hell as being nine concentric rings. And inside the ninth ring of hell, there are four smaller rings with no barrier between those rings except the level of frozenness that they contained. In fact, it's that fourth layer of the ninth circle of hell, the last ring in which the sinners also remain nameless. And they are completely isolated from all other life and light and warmth. And in fact, when you read Dante's literature, he is afraid to even enter into that last circle because of the isolation that happens. C.S. Lewis put it this way, reflecting on this passage and on Dante's Inferno. He said this, that hell is no one but yourself forever and ever. Hell is not the antithesis of heaven. Hell is a place of pain and a place of personal isolation where you are completely alone. But finally, hell is also a place where you are completely separated. Look at verse 26 and what scripture says. It says, and besides all this, between you and us. Now, this is Abraham answering the man. The man has said, please send Lazarus down to give me relief. And he says, he says that that can't happen because none can pass from there to here. And then 26 says this. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. Now, I love this word chasm that Jesus uses because this is the only time it's used in the Bible. It's the only time that Jesus uses it, which tells us that this gulf, this separation is different from all other chasms in the Bible. That this separation, that this gulf is beyond my ability and your ability to cross. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that we can't get there by any effort or any work that we do. And I also love the fact that he says, look, that this chasm has been fixed. Now, the tense that he gives us in makes us know that not only has it been done once, but the effect of it continues out. In other words, it's an event that's happened and we are continuing to feel the effects of it. And so what Jesus says, look, is that this thing has been separated. You have been separated from God, and the effect is that you are continually separated. It wasn't a one-time event. It didn't just happen once. It's happened, and it's ongoing. And so the thing that I began to ask this week was this question, is what thing has established this gulf, this separation between us and God, and continues to separate us from Him? The answer is sin. 
The answer is sin. Sin is the thing that has separated us once from God and forever from God, if left off to our own ability and our own selves. Isaiah puts it this way in Isaiah 59 too. He says, but your iniquities or sins have made a separation between you and your God. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6, 23. He says that for the wages of sin is death. Now this word for death in the Greek was literally the word that meant to separate from life. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So our sin is what has separated us from life, Paul says. He writes to the book of Galatians and writes this in chapter 5. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now notice, this list is amazingly similar, isn't it? to the list that we just gave in Colossians that we talked about last week, the old life. Paul goes on and he says this, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those things, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is what Paul is saying. He's not saying that, look, if you do these actions, that it's going to separate you from the kingdom. He's saying if your life, remember, is marked by these things, then there's no way that you can inherit the kingdom of God. You will miss the kingdom because you have lived a life that is based on the things here. You have lived a life that is not marked by Jesus. In Matthew chapter 25, we're not going to read all these verses, but Jesus is talking about the end times. And this is what he says. He says that there will be two groups of people and that what will separate those two groups of people is what they do in this life. He says, look, some of you, all right, will say, Jesus, when did we do this to you? When did we care for you? And when did we tend your wounds? And when did we lift you up? And he says, when you did it to the least of these in this life, you did it to me. He says, but there's going to be another group that will say, Jesus, we followed you and we obeyed your commands. And he says, but you didn't care for me. You didn't tend to me. You didn't take care of me when I was poor and when I was sick and when I was in prison. And they'll say, what do you mean we didn't do that for you? And Jesus says, when you did not do this to the least of me. In other words... When a poor man was laid at your gate, covered in sores, being licked by dogs with nothing to his name, and you lived your life feasting sumptuously, as Luke 16 says, passing by him every day and you did nothing, he says, and you did it to me. And what Jesus says in verse 44 to 46 of Matthew 25 is he says, one group he welcomes into his presence and the group that didn't do those things, that lived for themselves. He says, depart from me forever. Here's the truth about sin that we don't like to talk about. We want to treat sin like it's a behavior modification issue, right? That I just need to do the right things, that I just need to fix the things that are wrong with me, that if I do enough church or I do enough Bible study or I do enough prayer, if I do enough, I can fix this behavior that's going wrong with me. Can I tell you that's not true at all. There's no program or philosophy that will fix the sin in your heart. You are no match for the sin that's in your heart. The only thing, the only thing that can bridge that separation of sin in our lives is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's his death on the cross, his resurrection that has paid the cost and the price that we all Owed. And what Jesus teaches us in Luke 16 is that the reality of hell is that what is momentary for us will become permanent. That what is temporary in us being separated from God, what is temporal, will become eternal. Because our sin is an eternal state of separation from all that God is. Sin is a place, hell is a place of pain, it is a place of isolation, but worse than anything else, hell is a place of spiritual separation from God. So I want you to hear me on this. If God is a God of love, if God is a God of compassion and mercy and kindness and forgiveness and healing, then what the reality of hell is, is that it is an eternity of being separated from all of those things. It's an eternity of being separated from goodness and light and love and forgiveness and mercy and compassion and healing. That's 
but the reality of hell. And the reality is that that, what, that is what awaits anyone who does not place their faith in Jesus Christ and accept the forgiveness that he alone offers. C.S. Lewis, our John Piper, quoted and, and said this in his book, To the Ends of the Earth and Let the Nations Be Glad. He says that hell is a dreadful reality. To speak of it lightly proves that we do not grasp its horror. And I think this is true for us in the church today, isn't it? That we take hell so lightly and then we just don't talk about it. It's not that big a deal for us. Because you know what we want if we're honest inside the church? What we want is for Jesus to give us a better life here. What we want is for Jesus to give us a better life now. Heaven for us is a byproduct. Heaven for us is an added benefit. And that's not what it was meant to be. Heaven was meant to be a release. It was meant to be a deliverance from being separated from the goodness and love and mercy of God forever. Heaven was meant to be a moment where all that we were created and made to be, that we would be united with God forever to walk with him and talk with him and be with him. Jesus follower and you're watching this today, can I ask you if there is any chance that the Bible is true, if there's any chance that hell is real, that it is a place of eternal pain and isolation and separation, then are you willing to risk? Are you willing to risk it just so that you can live the life that you want to live now? If hell is real, if there's any chance that it's real, are you willing to risk that? so that you can remain free and that your life can be whatever it is that you want to be. Here would be my heart for you if you're watching this today, is that I think a lot of us shy away from this idea of hell because we're uncomfortable with the idea that God would send someone to hell, right? Can I tell you the other thing that Jesus teaches us in this passage? He doesn't just teach us that hell is a real place. He teaches us that hell is a real choice. Do you notice at the end of the passage, the the rich man says, please send Lazarus down. And Jesus says, look, he can't come down because there's this chasm that's been opened and no one else can cross it. And then the rich man says, well, at least send Lazarus to my family so that he could warn them about this place. And interestingly enough, I want to read to you what Jesus says here. He says that Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And the rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, if someone will only go to them from the dead, then they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will, be, will they be convinced if someone else should rise from the dead. Paul picks this up, and in the book of Romans he says that, Look, everyone can see the evidence of a creator God in the creation around us. He says, No one is without fault for turning away from God. And so what I want you to understand is that hell is not the place that God is going to send you. Hell is going to be your choice, that you are going to choose it for yourself. Because instead of living a life that's with God, what you're going to choose is to live a life without God. Paul says this in Romans, that verse that we read earlier, he says, For the wages of sin is death, right? It's separation. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you know the choice that God has made? It's not the choice to send people to hell. It's the choice to give us a free gift. It's the choice to give us eternal life. It's the choice to give us a way to not be separated from him forever. The choice to come to heaven. God doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose it for ourselves. And so this morning, I beg you, if you're watching this today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you would ask him to forgive you for your sins today. Paul writes this in the book of 2 Corinthians. He says just very simply, he says that for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. In other words, Jesus has done for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. He has bridged the chasm that has been opened up from sin for us. And all we have to do is call out to him, the book of Romans says, and ask him to forgive us, ask him to save us. And so would you do that today? 
if you're watching this today and you are a Christian, you are a Jesus follower, can I tell you, I think that question is the same for us. Do you believe that hell is real? Do you believe that it's a real place of pain and isolation and separation? Because if it is real, then why would we be even remotely okay with anyone going there? If it is real, if we truly believe that hell was a real place, shouldn't we be burdened and brokenhearted at the very idea of one of our family, one of our friends, one of our neighbors, one of our coworkers, someone on the other side of the earth with anyone being separated from the love and grace and mercy and kindness of God forever? And so the question for us is, do we think hell is real. In that same book, Let the Nations Be Glad, John Piper says this, that there is a felt difference in urgency when one believes that hearing the gospel is the only hope that anyone has of escaping the penalty of sin and living forever in happiness and the glory and presence of God. What John Piper is saying is that when we believe that hell's real, evangelism isn't optional anymore. That when we believe that hell is real, it's not just a choice of maybe I should share the gospel with someone. That when we believe hell is real, there will be a sense of urgency in us because the idea that someone would miss God, that someone would miss the kingdom and be separated from him forever would be unbearable to us. So let me ask you a question. Who's your one? Do you remember, I know it seems like a lifetime ago, before the pandemic, but do you remember at the beginning of March when we began to ask that question of who's the one person that you feel like God wants you to share Jesus with? Who's the one neighbor, family member, friend, coworker? Who's the one person that he's laid on your heart? Can I tell you that this pandemic has not changed their spiritual state at all? If they haven't accepted Jesus as their savior, they're still just as lost as they were before. They're still just as in much need of salvation as they were before. But this pandemic has also not changed our spiritual mandate. We should still be just as burdened, just as prayerful, just as ready, just as bold as ever. And sharing the good news should come because we sense the same urgency. Because like God himself, we desire all to be saved. Church family, that's why we preached on what we preached on last week in Colossians chapter 3. If you haven't watched that message, I want to challenge you to go back and to watch it. The reason why we post is important. The reason what we post and what we say, the reason why what the world sees in us is important is not so that they'll come to church. It's not so that they'll be our friends. It's not so that we can be seen as being relevant or popular or nice. The reason is so that when we share the gospel, they'll listen. That's the reason. And the reason it's so important for us to ask what marks our lives is because of the reality of hell. And the reality that if our lives are not marked by Jesus, how can we ever tell anyone about him? So look, here's my challenge to you today, is if you're a Jesus follower and you're watching this, is to ask the same question we asked you on March 1st, who is your one? Do you believe that hell's real? Do you believe that if they don't find Jesus, that they will be separated from him for eternity? And have you been steady and constant and praying for that person over this past time? Can I... Can I be honest with you for a second? I have lapsed in prayer for the ones who are on my heart. Too many times through this crazy season, things have been chaotic and busy, and I've been tired and worn out and anxious and fearful or just running and gunning, right? And so I want to challenge you the same thing that I felt God challenged me to do this week, which is begin to pray, begin to share, begin to look for the opportunities because this world needs Jesus as much today as it did before any of this. And so church family, let's be ready to tell them not only about a real place called hell, but about a real savior called Jesus who has come to save them, to reconcile them, to bring them into a relationship with God in which they can live with him forever. 
I love you so much. I'm so grateful that you've joined us for this message today. I want to give you an invitation that if you have any questions about what we've talked about today, if you have any questions about hell or about heaven, any questions about salvation, then I want you to feel free to send those to me. You can send me a message here on Facebook or on YouTube. You can send me an email, all right, by just going to j.haran at starkvillecommunitychurch.org or you can give me a call and I would be glad to sit down and to have a conversation and a dialogue with you. But here's what I want to do. Because this is a heavy subject, right? This is a serious, big thing. But as big as hell is, as serious a topic as it is, the good news is that that's not where God sends us. That's not God's choice for us. God's choice for us is Jesus. And so what I want us to do today is I'm going to ask the praise team to come. And they're going to share one last song with us today. A song that's going to point us back to Jesus, back to God, and remind us that his heart for you and his heart for me is not to be separated and isolated, but it's to live in communion with him forever. Would you pray with me, Father?